Dear Shalom, the journey of each person's neshama and the length of time Hashem gives it to be here 
is beyond any of our comprehension. It's something that I will struggle with until Mashiach comes. But I am grateful to Hashem that I was privileged to be a part of your journey. This gratitude started even before you were born. When I was expecting you, I was enveloped with a deep sense of peace and calmness. A singleton pregnancy after the twins felt like a breeze. Even your birth was so quick and peaceful. The love that Tati and I felt for you permeated the room. And when your siblings came to meet you, they fell in love with you immediately. And we realized the truth of the Medrash, Kol Hashvin Chavivin. Our seventh Tauber boy was certainly beloved. Your favorite and only sister Chaya's graduation was the day after you were born. Surprisingly, I felt so good that I was able to attend. You were the first boy born into our new beautiful Coconut Cay community. Chaya, with the help of community, lovingly prepared a beautiful bris for you. Even my students felt that they were a part of your celebration and were so excited to be at your bris. Your young neshama, again, expressing its unique ability to bring shalom and joy to the world, brought a schus to the kvaters who held you by your bris as they were benched with a baby boy within the year. We know that Hashem gives parents ruach HaKadosh before they name their child. From the moment we named you Shalom, it was obvious to us that it was divinely inspired. You were Shalem, complete in so many ways. You were Shalem. You brought so much peace into our home, our family, and even among your little friends. For that reason, your moras and classmates adored you. You brought so much more than your small self into the classroom. The simcha, chayis, and shalom that you possess internally was larger than life, and you carried it with you wherever you went. You were so excited to celebrate your upshurnish. You said the psukim so beautifully and bravely allowed everyone to cut your hair. You were so proud to join the big boy club and you were careful about wearing your new yarmulke and tzitzis. You sp- kept speaking about your upshurnish for the next month and loved playing and sharing all of your presents with others. Since you've been gone, these weeks have been challenging. I think about your smiles and giggles, your comments and questions, your energy and drive, your hugs and kisses, your humming and singing, your imagination and creativity, your goofiness and silliness, and your sincerity and connection to Hashem. These qualities are vibrant and alive in our family. We think about you, remember you, talk about you, and you will always be a comforting presence in our hearts and in our home. My sweet Shalom, you have left my world way too early. We want you back here with Triyas Mesim and Mashiach now. Again, your Neshama's journey is never something I'll ever be able to understand. And I'm broken. Each day, I want you back here with me. More than the day before. And I yearn more than I ever did for Tehiyah Samesim. I firmly believe that the way we can feel your presence in our lives is by working towards and experiencing true Shalom within ourselves, our homes, our communities, and in the world at large. Shalom, it's so hard to go on without you, our precious boy. The messages that brought me a glimmer of comfort throughout this deeply painful time were the ones where people shared with me how they acted b'shalom because of you, Shalom, as you personified in your short and powerful life what it truly means to be a peace lover and a peace seeker. Shalom, the one thing I will never be at peace with 
is remaining in this difficult gullus. And I ask you from your place on high to beg Hashem for the coming of Mashiach, the time when we will not only be reunited with our personal and beloved Shalom, but the Shekhinah will finally be able to shine in its full capacity in this world as a result of the Shalom that we are creating in your schus. We will not rest until this happens. With all my love, Mommy. Stand up for the Mora who faces the task, who remains with our kids when they're grown. She's giving our nation the power to last, for each child is a world of their own. Let's stand up for the Mora who gives heart and soul. Every day that she's playing her part For each parent and child In Klaus Run As a Mora ingrained in her heart So I was Shalom teacher this year this year, we had a schus to have Shalom in our classroom. I want to share with you some of the memories that I had with Shalom in the past year. It's hard to put so many special memories into words, but what I do remember most about Shalom, it's the way he behaved. He really stood out from all the rest of the kinderlach in the classroom with something unique. He will come every morning with a huge smile on his face from this door. And I will welcome him and say, Shalom, Shalom. Shalom brought with him a special light to the classroom. Shalom taught us how to love Daven to Hashem by showing his friends how to sit and have a nice day to Hashem how to be excited to wear yarmulke and tzitzis. He always dabbed nicely. I remember that Shalom will give his tzitzis rings to his friends that didn't have them and allowed them to kiss his. Shalom was a sharing mitzvah boy in our classroom. I remember that one of the girls wanted this book, that Shalom was in the middle of, middle of reading. So I told her that soon she will get it. But Shalom saw her and looked at her face and he saw that she really wanted it. And in less than a minute, Shalom just gave it to her like this. He came to me with a huge smile, hugged me and asked me, Mora, can I have a mitzvah note for sharing? Shalom was very proud of all his siblings and mommy and tati by showing me and showing his friends the family picture from the family picture wall. I remember he was saying, this is my mommy, this is my tati, this is my brothers, this is my sister Chaya, this is baby Zalman. Shalom was so excited to see his baby brother outside. He always looked for him. He, he looked for the stroller to see baby Zalman. And when he do, did saw him, he hold his hands and smiled to him and make him happy. He was excited to see his big, his big brother in the playground too. I want to say thank you. Thank you, Hashem for putting Shalom in my class. Thank you, Shalom, for teaching me how to love doing mitzvahs, 
how to dive in, how to be more patient, how to be happy, and how not allow disappointment when Hashem changes our plans. I love you, Shalom, and I will miss you forever. Shalom is peace, and Shalom is the way. A Rahay Dave Shalom seeks peace every day. He always is quick to forget and forgive. And that's how Hashem wants us to live. Shalom is peace, Shalom. segment that was that we saw in this month of Shabbos. There's a, an older fellow who talks about the loss of his daughter and how he came to the Rebbe to pour out his heart. And he the way he put it was that he had kindness, he had kindness to the Edisher for what had happened. And the Rebbe responded to him and said, first of all, Mimek Hoven Tainus to the from the Rebbe's perspective, he said, you can have kindness. Claim. Why was, why did this happen? Why was a young boy taken from his, from his family at such a young age? But from the other side, the Rebbe explained to him that in our limited capacity as human beings, we don't have the capacity to understand the ways of the Abish. And to try to comprehend them is pretty much impossible. So we end up with an acceptance, and in some cases, even, even thanks to the morals of, of all the experiences that they had, that we had as a family, Nechama, Menachem, the entire Tauber family, that we had with Shalom for, for these years. There's a fascinating Ayyem Yoyim that I, that's, uh, I believe, Haftal and Tevis. And in it, there's a story that the Rebbe Marash asked the Tzemach Tzedek, he asked him, what was your grandfather's point when he founded Chassidus Chabad? What was he trying to accomplish? And you would think the answer would be how the high spiritual how it's translated to, to esoteric levels of, of uh, spiritualism was probably the reason. But the Tzemach Tzedek said no. He said that the reason and my point of Chassidus Chabad was a tremendous sense of Abbas Yisrael between Yidin in general, but especially between Chassidim and between Anash. <coughs> and he referred to him, using the language, Chassidim ain't Mishpacha. That Chassidim are one family. Having been through the, the tragedy of this, this year's Yid based families and seeing everything that, that transpired, and the way that the community, the Anash, the community of, of Coconut Cave, under the leadership of Rabbi Kleiman, his wife, and his wife, the North North Miami Beach community, the Heber Kadisha, uh, the, uh, the kindness of Rabbi Klein from um, Healing Hearts, High Lifeline, OL, so many people from so many walks of life, but especially among what we, would, what we know as Anash, Anche Shlomeno, as the Lubavitch community. It really felt that every person that, that I came across, that came to the, into the home, their faces were as if this happened to, to their family, to their own Mishpacha. So it was deeply impactful for me just to, to witness that such a beautiful, warm community. And I think that everybody here should be, should be proud 
that they're part of this community, part of this beautiful Lubavitch community that helps each other, that feels for each other, and that was there in so many ways during this difficult period. Uh, on the flip side, of course, the end of the different Hayyim Yom is that the, the uh, brotherhood of Anash extends also, swings the other way. That in Mirza Hashem, the way Sidkas are shared among the Sidim, is on a whole different level. And that the language used in one Yom Yom is that the joy that the Abraham has, the way Sidim rejoice with each other, in each other's Sidkas, is at the level of the Aveda of Rabbi Shmuel Kaim Gadol on Yom Kippur. So, my wish is that we can all have the, the Bitochen. The Bitochen, first of all, that Mashiach is coming very soon. The Kitzir Ram Mashiach Niafar, as Nechama said, that Shalom will be with us. And we can celebrate all of the, the birthdays that we weren't able to celebrate. But we need to take the Betochen to, to a real level of Betochen. Betochen is, is living today with the belief of what's going to happen tomorrow. That's how strong we need to believe in what's going to happen with the ultimate coming of Mashiach. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Rabbi Yosef Paltiel, who is a personal friend of Menachem and the founder of Inside Hasidus, to give us a few words of inspiration and chizm. There's an expression which is a Apparently in the Gemara, that's quoted in Hasidus, that says, Tavna de Libe le Katsve inch. Tavna de Libe, the word Tavna in Aramaic is the same as the Hebrew word Gavin, which means color, the flavor of the heart cannot be recorded, cannot be written down. The language of the heart as we all know, is poorly represented by words. Words do such a poor job at trying to say what we feel that they frustrate us. And I guess this is why we cry, this is why we show anger and frustration, because we feel, we feel very deeply, we feel very strongly. And A, we don't know how to say what we feel. And B, we don't know what to do with what we feel. We don't know how to manage it. What place it has in our lives. How do we fit it into all the other things that allow us to function as people in the real world? I happened to be here, Yud Beis Thomas. I was here coincidentally 30 days ago today. I was invited to Fabreng for, I guess, for the Anash and the Yeshiva in North Miami Beach. And I was sitting in the Beis Abedish all day long and I was given this very unpleasant news. And uh, whether I liked it or not, it was something that I needed to address at the Fabreng. 
Menachem is a student of mine. That's the simple truth of the matter. He learned by me many years ago in Chayvah Vitello. And um, he actually reached out to say that he saw my talk. So I responded. And I, I believe that's why I'm here. I'm not here because I found it in San Chasidis, so I'm a teacher from 20 years ago. The the hand of God, uh, made me a part of this, uh, whether I like it or not. So here I am. I cannot speak to anybody's feelings. I can't even speak to my own feelings. Uh, I, I met Mr. Tabos was on Gesundheitstag in the street a few days after, and I approached her. And I tried to say what I thought, what's the right thing to say? How are you supposed to say to Abba, this is Menachem's mother? And she said to me, you know, we all belong to a special uh, club. <laughs> what we share is that I many, many years ago lost a child. Under very different circumstances, he cannot compare one tragedy to another. But the inability to manage emotion, the inability to find language for emotion, the inability to know where to put feelings, I think is constant. It's, it's all pain. The, the feeling of pain doesn't really have good language, certainly not with words. And it's very, very difficult to manage. It's very, very difficult to, what's the word, to constructively Incorporate, I'm not going to say to constructively use, I think that's too difficult a word to use, but to even manage it. So as different as tragedies are, we're kin in a strange, maybe even morbid kind of a way. And I feel this is why I am standing here, that I'm speaking on the occasion of dislation. And I prepared words, I prepared words because that's all I could do. I cannot prepare emotions because it would be unmanageable and certainly uncommunicable and not helpful. So I'm gonna share some thoughts that I wrote down on a piece of paper in conjunction with this event for the assembled, and I'm assuming that there's people in other places who are also participating with us, and perhaps maybe a few words even from the Nachem and the Chama. I recently heard a story. I'm in the business of collecting stories and selling them. That's what I do. I take and I give. And I recently heard a story that I never heard before that I feel is very appropriate opening to this kind of an event. 110 years ago, in Tsarist Russia, there was a blood libel. The blood libel happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago in the dark ages when people were primitive. Well, 110 years ago, Evidently, people who were mad in Russia were still quite primitive. There was a blood libel that consumed Russia. And it put at risk the lives of, of thousands and thousands of Jews who lived in Russia. It was so senseless, it was so stupid, it was so baseless. But it didn't matter. What mattered was that there was a blood libel. The man tried, was a, officially a Lubavitcher Chassid by the name of Mendel Bayliss. And as somebody told me, they proved that he used Christian blood for the Matzahs from the Zoya, not from factual evidence, but from Kabbalah book. The whole thing was very upside down. Essentially, the Jewish people were on trial, Yiddishkeit was on trial, Hasidus was on trial, and the Jewish people were on trial in a nation that was racked with anti-Semitism. And it was a very, very dangerous and serious thing. All the Gedalians fell in Russia, including the Rebbe Hashem himself, and the Gedalian of the Snagde, Reb Chaim Riske, the Chafetz Chaim, all the Gedalians saw at that time were personally involved in dealing with this because it really was a very dangerous moment. The Mayor Shapiro lived in Poland. The Mayor Shapiro was in his 20s. The Mayor Shapiro was an incredible genius, an unbelievable talent, Chochem, and a, a free thinker with a great mind. And all by himself, the Mayor Shapiro sent a notice to the Rav of Moscow at that time, Rav Mazor with a proposal, with a suggestion. He said to him that if at the trial the following question is raised, so I'm sending you the answer. It was very interesting uh, intuition. The Chazal say that the Jewish people are called Odom, al 
of Dalit men, man, other. And we find in the Gemara, Atam Kriyam, other human Jewish people are called other, and the nations of the world are not called other. And of course, if you want to spin that Chazal in an undesirable way, if your interests are anti Semitic, you can use a quote like that to create all kinds of hate against Jews and Judaism. So the Mayor Shapiro sent a note, Harab Mazon, the chief, the rabbi of Moscow, and he gave him an insight. And as it turned out, during the trial, they actually asked this question. And the answer had been prepared by a rabbi in Poland who sent it unilaterally, just in case, just in case, the question would be necessary and relevant. So when the prosecutors brought up this Maimon Chazal, that indicates that the Jewish people see themselves as superior to everybody else, that Atam Kuyim Adam, only you are called Adam, and the rest of the nations of the world are not called Adam. So the uh, defense attorney had the answer waiting. And he asked the judge, Your Honor, you preside over many cases. And a lot of the cases you preside over are quite serious. In an average case, how many character letters do you get? How many letters do you get showing support for the accused? And he gave a number, two or three or four. And he says, and how many did you get for this trial? He says, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. And how many of the tens of thousands of Jewish people who wrote letters in defense of this man, Mendel Bayless, know him? Very few. So the, the defense attorney said, this is the meaning of the expression. Adam Kriyam Adam. Adam means man. And man actually means man and woman. But there is no plural for Adam. There is no Lashon Rabin for the word Adam. There is a Lashon Rabin for the word Ish, and Isha, and Gevin, and Geveret, and Enosh, and Anusha. There is no Lashon Rabin. Adam is singular. The man Shapiro sent, sent this message, which was passed along to the judge. The Jewish people are called Adam because they're one, because they're singular, because we are one. And this is how we experience tragedy. It's a fact. We feel each other. And at moments of, of considerable pain, of real pain, you see the best of the, the most beautiful of who we are as a people, as a family, as a community. You see how we're really all one. And that's what makes us other. And in a very, very simple sense of the word, that's what makes us mention. Because that's what the word other means in convention. A mensch. We're here. We're gathered. We got together. What's the point and purpose of this gathering? The point and purpose of this gathering is to encourage each other, to strengthen one another. What else can we do? And obviously we're here and we're gathered because something very painful occurred and we need to support each other, we need to find language, words, form, more than anything else, action that will help us heal as a community, as a people, as a family, as individuals. And um, of course, the most important thing that we all appreciate is that if something good is if something if we're gonna somehow navigate through this, it's gonna be by doing good actions. We're coming from Tisha B'Yav, and right after Tisha B'Yav, we have Hamisha Asa B'Yav. And Hamisha Asa B'Yav is the antithesis of Tisha B'Yav. Tisha B'Yav is considered the lowest point in our year. Hamisha Asa B'Yav is considered the highest point in our year. And ironically, the two interface. They always come together. Because this is human nature. This is certainly the nature of the Jewish people. That when we face the greatest tragedy, when we have the greatest hardships, the best of who we are emerges. And we rise. I, I think this is part of who human beings are, but it's especially, especially true of Yidin. Yidin have this unique ability this incredible ability to be faced with all kinds of difficulties and from the difficulties we find strangely incredible strength and incredible will to go on and to do good 
And, and I, I suppose that the simple explanation for this is because we don't always live our lives in the best place in our soul. Every one of us has layers. All of us have layers. We have outer layers and inner layers. We have outer layers that we want people to see because they make us look good. We have outer layers we wish nobody would see because they don't make us look so good. But there are shallow cells. There are superficial cells. There are surface cells. And then there are deeper layers in ourselves. There are layers in ourselves that we know we possess that we may not have visited for a long time. There may be depths within our nishama, within our psyche, that we know is there, that we may have experienced once or twice or three times in our lives, and we say, you know, I should visit that place within me, because that's my place of truth. That's my place of genuineness. That's my place of goodness. That's my place of sacrifice. But it's difficult. And it's just easier, it's just easier to live our lives on the surface. And then circumstance, reality, life, sometimes forces us to go into the deepest place within ourselves. Tisha B'Av is a tragic day in our history. It's a tragic day in our history. The one thing Tisha B'Av did not do is destroy us. Because we're still here. And if Tisha B'Av has not destroyed us, and Tisha B'Av is the most tragic moment in our lives, that means that it's reasonable, that it's likely that when you go through Tisha B'Av, each person looks into the depths of himself or herself that we would normally not visit. Because I'm busy. I'm busy on the surface. I'm busy on the outside. And this is what happens when we experience pain and tragedy as individuals, as a community, as a family. Everybody when I mean, every person could remember where they were 30 days ago when they heard this news and could recollect their initial reaction, the sense of helplessness and hopelessness and anger and frustration and disappointment and all the other feelings. And along with all of that, there was also a, a reflection on our own MS. There was a reflection that was going down to the deepest place in ourselves. The place in ourself which is the biggest chassid. The place in ourself which has the most amuna. The place in ourselves which is the most kind. The place in ourselves which is most ideal. The place in ourselves that's most, most willing, to, willing to give. We, went, we visited that point. Everybody, I think, visits that point. And it comes up. So strangely, ironically, at moments like these, we see incredible beauty. And I guess the essence of that beauty, or the, the simplest expression of that beauty, is achos. All of a sudden, there are no differences. All of a sudden, the petty, silly things that preoccupy us in our surface life have no value. And we all appreciate but the only thing that really matters is what's really real. And what's really real is that each of us is deeply good, and each of us is deeply righteous, and each of us is deeply connected to Hashem, and each of us is interested in living a life that reflects those values. And this pain, this unbelievable pain, brings all this goodness out. And it shows itself in this kind of achas, it shows itself in this kind of unity. So my, simplest, my simple proposal, a simple, simple thought, a simple idea, a common sense idea, is there are going to be many simchas in the foreseeable future by everybody. And I'm not just telling this to you, I'm telling this to me because I, like the next person, I'm lazy. There are going to be simchas in the foreseeable future. There are simchas that we're planning to go to. And there are simchas that we weren't invited to. And then there are the simchas, really, I need to go to that one. <laughs> there are so many of them, Baruch Hashem, I live in Kwan Heights, you can have four or five weddings a night if you want. Literally. And how many of the chayims? All of us are here. Because this brought the best out of us. 
And the greatest thing we can do for ourselves, and so that the Rabbi Leiber mentioned, so that's a miracle, is that we should express, we should exercise the same kind of empathy, the same kind of caring, the same kind of this is mine when we celebrate Simchas. The previous Rebbe, in his very frank talks, laments the difference between how Americans participated in one another Simchas and they did it in the old country. In the old country, the Simchas were very simple. But the joy was very real. In America, the Simchas are beautiful. They're materially beautiful. And the joy is very surface. It's very superficial. Chassidim really experience pain with one another. And Hasidim really should experience one another's joy. It's a very difficult thing to do. It just goes against human nature. Because this is just the way it is. Pain brings the best out of us. Joy, not so much. It's just like this. But it's unfortunate, and it's wrong. And we all know it's wrong. So this is a simple, practical thing that we can all do. When we are not in the mood, and we say, you know, someone has a simcha, I'm going to go. And I'm not just going to go and say hello, I'm going to feel a part of it. I'm going to be happy for them. And this is a real, it's not a healing. There's no healing for this. There's no healing for this. But it's a real proactive good that could come from a tragedy of this magnitude. And we'll all do ourselves a favor collectively if we sort of make this hachlata as a community that we should share in one another's joys. We should really share one another's joys. I got married 32 years ago. At my wedding was a kid named Chasko Brod. Chasko Brod lived on the block where my wife grew up and now I live there. Chaska Brod was an elderly Jew at that time, he was probably in the 70s already then, and he danced at my wedding like a yeshiva bachet. And he danced very much well, like a yeshiva bachet. He had this knack of being happy for you and demonstrating it. And he danced and danced. He was an old man. And I remember seven years later or nine years later, whatever it is when we lost our child, he, he mourned with us also. And I think we would all be well served if we made this our personal hachotra, we all feel each other's pain. Let's try in the golden America, in the modern materialistic America, to truly participate with our bodies and with our hearts in one another's joy. And I think this will be an unbelievable healing for everybody. And it'll be it'll be it'll be something good, something really good that take from something so terribly painful. I, I, it's ironic. I, I was sitting on the right, my talk, so of course I was corresponding with Menachem. Sholem's parents are Menachem and Nechomah. It's the same name. Menachem and Nechomah both mean the same thing. And they both mean consolation. Now, if you think about it, Menachem and Nechomah need the consolation. But it's not Menachem and Nechomah ben Shalom, it's Shalom ben Menachem and Nechomah, it's backwards. This little boy, Shalom, whose life, the Amish decided should be this short, is the children of Menachem and Nechomah. Is the children, it's he, his name, means this is what comes after consolation. This is what comes after me. Nihumin. And you think about the timing. This Shabbos is called Shabbos Nachamu. We're coming from Tisha B'Av. It, it doesn't make it any easier, but it is worth observing. And we're literally at a Chamish Asaviyah. We're at the period in our calendar. We're coming out of the saddest time. And Hashem says, Nachamu, Nachamu. And Hashem consoles all of us. And hopefully He consoles and Only God, only God can heal. I heard many years ago, I was at an event, a very tragic event, and uh, a Yid Yarok, and he quoted Harav Shleimehech from Chicago, Zechim and Lebrach, Olam HaShom. I'm assuming that he heard it from Yidna, the generation before him. He said, 
Baruch Goizer Ukai. Baruch Goizer Ukai. And it translated in Yiddish. The Rebish der Schneid und Halt. I'll translate it into English, and I'm sorry that this is a this is a very powerful word. Hashem cuts and holds. Hashem gives unbelievable challenge, and only he, only he can heal. Only he can console. Only he he can somehow help a father and a mother get through. A tragedy, an event like this. But I want to speak to the little boy's name. It's the Nechama brings Shalom. Shalom ben Menachem and Shalom ben Nechama. You may remember there's a Rashi in the end of Bereshis where he analyzes Noyach's name. What does Noyach mean? And he can spell it like this and spell it like this. And one of the proposals that Rashi makes is his name shouldn't be Noyach, his name should be Menachem. And Rashi explains why his name is Noyach. Shalom is the son of Menachem and Nechoma, which means, in my uh, interpretation, that after, from this Nechoma there needs to become Shalom. From this event, from this pain, and hopefully from this healing, there needs to become peace. That's what his name means, Shalom ben Menachem and Shalom ben Nechoma. And the parents of Shalom have this one wish, that everybody should, who is touched by this tragedy, and we all are, directly or indirectly, should somehow take from this pain the message of peace. And you don't need me to tell you the way peace works. The easiest place to have peace is with strangers. The people you don't know you get along with well. You sit on an airplane next to somebody for 15 minutes or an hour, it's okay. If it's 10 hours, if you get uncomfortable, right? The peace becomes more and more difficult and becomes closer and closer to us. The people of your country, the people of your city, the people of your community, the people of your lap, the people who live in your building, and of course the peace becomes most difficult when it gets to which people? Your spouse, your parents, your children. And the most difficult of all is the peace you have to have with yourself. And we all look, and this is what America does best, we all look for external peace. I'm going to send food to hungry people in Asia. Why don't I send food to the neighbor next door? Because the neighbor next door deserves to be poor because he's a butler. What about the person in Asia? I don't know. So send them money. Taylor teaches us that we have to figure out how to make peace where it is most difficult. And the most difficult place to make peace is within our own heart. To make peace with ourselves. One of the most difficult things to do is to be at peace with ourselves. And that's very religious. It's not only psychological. Being at peace with yourself is not only a mental and psychological issue. It's a religious issue. Because peace with self is acceptance of self. And acceptance of self is acceptance with the life that HaGadosh Baruch Hu gave me. One of the most tragic ways a person can live is he always wants somebody else's life. And one of the most peaceful ways a person lives is that the life that Hashem gave him is the life that he should have. And if a person is able to be at peace with himself, he can figure out how to be at peace with his spouse, and at peace with his parents, and at peace with his children. But all of these relationships are complicated and difficult, because there's a lot of baggage. A I, 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 simple example, but so universally relevant. There is no mitzvah in the Torah. There's no mitzvah in the Torah. That makes more sense than Kibbutz Davei. I mean, think which one? What makes more sense than Kibbutz Davei? And forgive me for admitting it in public. There's no myth in the Taylor that we struggle more with than Kibbutz Davei. The Rebbe once said this. The Rebbe once, it's an old expression, but the Rebbe actually said, My father and a mama can raise her children, ten kinder, and ten kinder, ten is not talking about mama. A mother can raise ten children, ten children know how to take care of their mother. It's true. It's true. And there's so much psychology. Why is keeping the so hard? Why is it so hard? Because I have chesbonis, you know. I have 50, 60, 70 years of experiences that complicate the relationship. And the same is true with our spouse, right? Why don't couples get along? Because I remember we did last week and last month and last year and last decade, and I'm right. I'm absolutely right. And the same is true with our children. 
frequently our relationships with our children are complicated. Now, of course, if I'm my parent's child, then my child is my child. So he looks at me, I have a cheshman with my father, and I have a cheshman with my mother. And being at peace in these relationships is really hard work. It's hard. Kibbutz of aim is hard, not because what we do is hard, but because we need to let go of this silly, silly calculations about my father hurt me here, and he ignored me there, and he insulted me on the other occasion, and so on and so forth, to let it go, to let it go. And this allows us to have peace with our parents, and it certainly lets us have peace with our spouse, and and it even lets us have peace with our children, and our children have peace with us. And this, this is the request of Shalom's parents, that this tragedy, which touches all of us, should encourage us to ask ourselves, where can I bring peace into my own life? beginning with peace with myself and continuing with peace to the people closest to me, to the people with whom my relationship is most complicated. And because of the complexity of those relationships, we, we'd much rather make peace with strangers than with the people closest to ourselves. But the truth of the matter is, if we figure out how to make peace with ourselves and with the people closest to ourselves, those the more distant relationships are so simple. And so easy. It's, it's really a question of growing up. Of Zayna Mensch. And if people will learn this lesson, then something really good will have come from something which is otherwise very, very difficult. And I, I want to finish with my own personal thoughts. I told this to you during Shiva Menachem. get on an airplane, and you get in your seat, and you've done it a hundred times, and the stewardess's nagging voice gets on the microphone and talks, and you know exactly what you're going to say, you know her speech by heart, and you really want her to be quiet, I can tell you that from early this morning, and she makes a speech, and her speech involves a lot of rules, and one of the rules that she tells you is, if the pressure in the cabin will drop, an oxygen max mask will drop from above your seat. Grab it, pull it to yourself, put it over your nose and mouth, and put the strap around your back and tighten it to make it fit and breathe normally. Now what does she say next? Remember, remember, the bag may not fully inflate, but the oxygen is flowing. Breathe normally. And then he says, she says, if you are with children, secure your own mask and then secure the mask of your children. Why? Why? Why would the stewardess tell you to first put on your own mask and then put on the mask of your children? It's so counterintuitive. It so goes against our nature. And of course, the answer that's exactly why she's saying it. Because the tate mame gesund. The father and mother need to be well. And if the father and mother will be well, the children will be looked after. I, I give you a bracha. Menachem and Echav, from the bottom of my heart, from someone who was there many years ago, figure out how to be together and to be close. This, is, this tears people to pieces. It absolutely tears people to pieces. And it tears each one of us to so many little pieces, we can't even imagine. Forget about putting together two of us. How do I put all my pieces together? This is, the, this is the right thing to do. Figure out, I know you don't need to hear this, and I know that it's maybe saying things that I shouldn't say, but I'm saying them anyway. I give you a bracha to do it together, to be 
together go through this incredibly painful experience as a couple come out of it more unified than you went into it <coughs> and raise your children amidst Hashem with health and gesund you want you want your son's life to bring peace to the world well forgive my candor but I do have a right to say this to you it starts with you. I'm sure you're getting along. I'm sure you had trouble advice in the last 30 days. But everybody knows that the Avela starts when people walk away. And no, nobody else is around. That's when the Avela really starts. Figure out how to do it together, how to stay together, to be strong. You know, the example that I probably gave you was a wheel has many, many spokes, but the wheel has an axis. The wheel has a, a center. The center of the wheel of your home is you. You, you as a couple, figure out how to be together through this incredibly difficult tragedy and raise your children the shame of the fetus. Only the Abishta can heal your heart. That's why he's God, right? People say, how are you supposed to explain God? No, try to explain this. And we should all together, b'shalom, or b'yav, or b'yachva, you mentioned that, yeah, yeah. Right? As chassidim zon zayin, ein mishpacha, al pi toira b'ahava. Those are the words. Al pi toira b'ahava. Because only al pi toira can there be real ahava. So, uh, on behalf of Lubavitch all over the world, I'm the guest. I say, every member of Anash, wherever they live, share in this pain. And perhaps I speak on behalf of everybody. And I, I wish us all to rejoice in one another's simchas, where we mourn one another's tragedies. And if we would get as many comments on COL when there's a simcha as we get when there's a tragedy, <coughs> we, we'd all be better for it. L'chaim, 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 Yosef Abrams is going to deliver a message on behalf of the community. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about Shalom and um, what I learned from him and what uh, he meant to our community. Uh, Shalom, I feel, brought a lot of access to our Kibula. And I believe that um, he, he brought many members of our community myself, I speak for myself, um, to come to um, a deeper level of connection within ourselves and with Karen Shamas and therefore access between each other. He was born, he was born when after the Tavis had already moved to Kokonake, we celebrated his bris in our show. months ago, we, um, we already got a lot more family members that already joined the community since, since that time, years ago. Um, so we were, uh, a lot of people coming in, getting to know each other. Um, we came together for, for uh, Stokla, Sukim, Kila, celebrate Shalom's Avshernish. Um, and he, again, brought us together. Um, <clears throat> on, on that day, I, I was going through some stuff in my head. Um, it, was, it was whatever, it was the end of the school year, I had uh, a lot of work to do, and uh, I was feeling down on the morning of his opportunity, and um, I wasn't really in the mood of going. Um, I, I, I ended up coming in. Someone gave me a smile, lifted me up, connected me to the Simcha, to the people around me. And like Rabbi Kokil mentioned the, the Vart, the Bar of Klezer Mikhaim, that uh, the Ibishter gives us Kleach to Mikhaim to stand, to stand strong. Um, I think that was, that was his, his message to me, to, to, to Mikhaim, don't, don't, get so, don't get so bogged down in your stuff. Come, join the Simcha. He's able to, to, to that 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 um, um, that moment for me, I, I, you know, was, I was uplifting, and it was like, get out of yourself. Look, look, look at the bigger, stronger.
picture. Um, the, there's a story on, on this topic. I wanted to say a story and then mention uh, something about the community and then I'll finish off. The story of the phase of Lublin was once uh, a, a Yid, a Mashka, a Yid that was going to pay rent to parts. Lo and behold, he didn't have the rent. The parts came and he gave him a patch. And he told him next week, if you don't give me a thousand rubles, I'm going to come back here and give you even bigger clap than I just gave you now. It's going to really hurt you. So the Yid runs to his tzaddik, runs to the Chleza of Lublin, and he tells the Chleza, he, he, he comes over and the, the Rosh Hashanah, the Chleza is in the Shabbos, was, was standing there and he tells him, I need to see the Chleza, and he says, what happened? He tells him the story, I have to have a thousand rubles by next week or else I'm going to get a bigger clap. So the Rosh Hashanah tells him, fly, you have to run away, don't even deal with this, this, this story is beyond. Anything he could, uh, you know, you have to run away. He says, okay, I hear you. He says, okay, so run. He says, I'm running. He went to see the Chayza. I, I, you know, you're a holy man, but I came here to see the Chayza of Lublin. So he says, okay, let me try to get an appointment. Come to see the Chayza of Lublin. And the Chayza tells him, um, when the parts comes to you, you tell the parts that when, that you'll stay if he gives you 50,000 rubles. Right? Sounds like a deal. I'll stay if he gives me 50,000 rubles. So he comes, comes out and he tells the Rav Shetzer what the, what the Chayzer said, and he comes home all happy. And uh, the, ball of, uh, the parts comes a week later, and he says, where's my 1,000 rubles of rent? He says, I don't have it. And you know what? He says with all this Chedisha Chutzpah, I'll stay in your inn if you give me 50,000 rubles. So the guy got so angry at him, gave him such a clap, gave him a good beating. He had fell down on the floor half conscious and he tells him that before he leaves the parts tells him and you're kicked out leave leave here tomorrow with your whole family and the parts goes home and he tells his wife i kicked that yid out of the tavern i'm done with him she says what you kicked the yid out of the tavern i come from a big city i'm used to a big nightlife i go to the tavern every night he's so nice he has people over he serves drinks he serves me drinks and people like to like his company Why'd you kick him out? Well, what's your problem? No reason you have to run that in like that year does. What? So she tells him, listen up. You better tell him he can stay or I'll, I'm packing my bags and I'm going back home. What? What are you talking about? Get somebody else to run in. No, tell him he can stay. So, so, he, so, uh, so the man is like, wow, she's serious. She started to pack her bags. He goes back to the year. The is getting off the floor. He's being treated. He's half kind. Oh, Kenny's conscious. And he comes to the Yid and says, you can tell him you could stay. So the Yid tells him what? I'll stay if you give me 50,000 rubles. So the man's like, you're insane. 1,000 rubles, I'll forgive you, man. 50,000, 10, just 20. Now he goes back home and he sees his wife is already calling the cab. So he, he tells her what's going on, I'm leaving. But the guy wants 50,000 rubles. So, okay, so give him where I'm leaving. So he runs back, gives the Yid 50,000 rubles on free rent. So the Yid, a month later, recuperates and goes back to the place of Lublin. He meets the Rav Shetzer, and the Rav Shetzer asks him what happened. He said, so I think this guy, he gave me a clap, but then he, so, so the, um, so the Rav Shetzer said, aha, uh -huh, I see. What I saw when you came to me, I said, I told you to run, because I could only see what's going to be, what was the, 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 the dark that was going to happen. The place of Lublin was able to see past the darkness. He was able to see, the, what's going to happen after, after that, the, the strength that's going to come after. So, we as a community were, were growing, and we, we were, um, two months, two, a month ago, a month ago, we were, we were putting together all kinds of committees and things to get our show up and running, to move into a new place. I was making phone calls, connecting people, can you do this, can you do that? What's your opinion on this, your opinion on that? It's taking a long time to get things, putting things together. It was taking, no, I was taking time. And um, I feel like on Yud Beis Thomas, um, we got a message that that there, when you have a, a, a Gila of an Ashoma, when you can reveal your Pachat um our community uh, stood up to, to, to the plate. Um, uh, transcended their limitations um, 
And with, as, as Solomon has done by, throughout his life, it, he, he's a, a part of us. Focus on that time. And focus, focus on what needs to get done now. Um, the phone calls, the, the um, get organizing, picking things up, putting things, uh, bringing things together, put, put it, uh, the, the everyone joined together um, on, on uh, one one group, oh, connecting, making things happen within minutes of time. Um, I, I think it could be a, a business school study with how much got done in the next two days and uh, a week. And with uh, Gila and Shama that, that happened to all of us in the connection, um, uh, I had a pers pers personally, I think Shama taught me something great. But, um, I had an experience at that time. Um, I, was, I wasn't there. I, I left to Israel. Um, and the way I had stopped off to, I had to I had pre book tickets for whatever. Or there to Israel on the way I stopped off by the oil. And it was the first time that um, I was able to actually uh, um, connect with my nephesh. When I wrote my nephesh, I didn't, my, my time, my opinion nephesh, I, it wasn't about me, it was about um, the community, our, our, our brotherhood, our sisterhood together. It was a transcendence um, that, that took place. Um, the, um, Shalom brought that out within us, um, in in our in our soul, and he's uh, continuing to do so. And he's like Rabbi Paltiel mentioned, he's gathered us here in Shabbos Nachum. Um, Hashem, Hashem should be Nachum us, bring us Nachama, and we are committed to continue Shalom's devotion for for Shalom for Achdus as a community, and let. By the Tower family, I'd like to ask uh, now Rabbi Yaakov Menacher to come up and introduce how we will keep up the Achdus and spread it until coming Mashiach, as Hashem can happen now. I promise you I won't give you long. Shalom has left us, Pirashmas. Yes. But Achayas remains an energy, a desire to grow, unite, and to do more is felt among us. The loyal Midrashua Ikra Ela Amaisa, and it is not the study which is the main thing, but rather the deed. So it is in his name, in Shalom's, in Shalom's name. He would like to dedicate a center, a center of Shalom, a place, a venue, here in our community, for our community, for all of Anash, <coughs> somewhere where the youth, a child, an adult can find peace, peace and serenity, a place of healing, Hamakim. Hamakim yinachem eschem. Double nechem. Nachem unachem uami. Menachem in nechem. I know this is what this is what you guys want. Like you said, nechem. The next step, the offspring of Menachem and nechem, is Shalom. The offspring of Menachem and nechem, and nechem, excuse me is a Shalom Center, a place where, they, we, where we can experience Shalom. We will grow with this. We're committed to bring light, shining a torch where it's dark. Therefore, we'd like to dedicate a center, a Shalom Center, if you will, a center where a child can receive therapy, multiple rooms 
will be available for occupational therapy, speech therapy, sensory therapy, childhood trauma response program, group therapy, emotional therapy. This is how we will take action. We're going to move forward. Keeping his memory. This Shalom Center already exists. We have a place. And renovations have begun. The plan is in motion. Be'er Hashem, the plan is to be already operational, starting Tov Shin Peg Gimel. And I'd like to finish with a pasuk. God will yiyeh kvoid habayis hazer ha'achrin min harishin. Omar Hashem tzevokis. Ubemokim hazer et in sholeim ne'um Hashem tzevokis. This is going to be a center for the whole community. It will be a place. A place where anybody can come. Where anybody can experience show. It's not just a place for, for our community, coconut care, individual community. But like Uri said, Siddamin Mishpacha. This is a place for all of us. And this is a place where we'll continue in our way from our small community to shine a light. To bring show. To bring people together. A place people can fabricate together, can daven together. A place of healing and a place of therapy. As a shell, will succeed. Okay. We're now going to have a Simon Schneis in Shalom's memory, followed by Mayu, and then there will be a starting of a secretary of Shalom's memory that will take place in the lobby. being the end of the Shleishim, my son Sean, is also the 14th yard site of my sister, Chayrachol, Allah Shalom, Bas, Baruch Chaim Tel Maruchim, Mentioning my father, I owe him a great debt, not just for, for all the years that he raised me, but following this tragedy, my son may Hashem bench my father and my mother with long life many many years and much nachas from all their grandchildren until 120 throughout the Shleshen the entire Shishas Dharan Shishas Adar Mishnah were completed in Shalom's memory. So I'm going to conclude the last Mishnah of Misafis Uktin. Amr Rabbi Yishu of Levi. Rabbi Yishu of Levi said, Asa da Kaddish Baruch Hu lahan chilachol tzadik v'tzadik shleish meish v'asar v'ala elomis. 
The Eivishter is going to bestow upon every single tzaddik the time of Asad Lava, the time of Mashiach, 310 elements, 310 worlds. Shanema, like it says in the Pasuk, Lahan Chalei Rayesh, where it's the same in Malay. Like the Pasuk says in Mishle, I will. I will give a, a uh, inheritance uh, to my to my beloved Yesh, which is Shin Yud Shai, three hundred and ten, by Sam and Malay, and their and their um, and their um, their treasures should be filled. Amr Rabbi Shimon Mechalafta. Rabbi Shimon Mechalafta said, "Lay matzah kadosh baruch hu kli machzik brachol Yisrael." Kaddish Baruch Hu did not find any vessel that could contain contain the blessings for the Yidin. Elah Hashem, only peace. Shnamar, it says in the pasuk, Adi Noi Oiz La'amu Yitain, Adi Noi Yevarech Es Amu Hashem. Nishlamu Meseches Uktzim. The cool Mesechais, Mesechasaychi, the Taras, the Nishlomo, Shisha, Sidre, Mishnah. Hadam Allah, Seder Zraim, Seder Mayim, Seder Nashim, Seder Nazikin, Seder Kachim, Seder Taras, Seder Taras. Hadam Allah, Daitam Allah, Seder Zraim, Seder Mayim, Seder Nashim, Seder Nazikin, Seder Kachim, Seder Taras, the Daitam Allah. When in the Shemineh, when this in the Nisnishim <laughs> Mitzvahsel, <laughs> Yasha, 
Simcho, Arinai, Vigil, Tzadikim, Arinu, Koyer, Shalei, Nele, Rakit, Varecha, Varelun, Silasi, Aitcha, Kianisani, Vatehi, Leit, Yeshua.